Okay, so uh, we're going to have the presentations today. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, so um, once you've done your presentation, um, you need to upload your script to the assignment to get credit. So uh, I don't know if you hand wrote it. Uh, I should change that, but um, so. Hopefully it's word processed. You can just upload it, but let me also make it possible for you to, for instance, shoot a picture of something you wrote on a piece of paper and put up. So let me unrestrict that. So that means it would accept uh, both a text entry, like you could open up a box uh, when you do the submission and just copy paste, or you could upload a photo. If you wrote it on a piece of paper, you could upload a, a photo, or you could um, upload a PDF, a Word document, whatever, uh, just so that I have a copy of uh, whatever it was that you used for your script for the presentation. Um, I can see that a huge portion of the class is not present today may have to do with air quality, may have to do with, you know, the uh, <laughs> entropy of associated with a class where you don't have to attend every time. I'll be trying to find out a little more about that. So thank you for being here. Uh, those who are not here are going to lose some points for not being here, but uh, they can still upload a script and uh, we can take it for there. If it turns out there's a health issue or something which is keeping people away, obviously they wouldn't be penalized for not being here. But uh, thank you all for, for being here for uh, <clears throat> today for this part of it. And uh, <coughs> we're going to get going in a sec, just looking ahead um, to the syllabus and what's coming up next. Um, over the Thanksgiving break, you have the possibility of doing another extra credit assignment. Uh, this one is uh, tied to this week's discussions about uh, media operations. And so uh, you could make, um, let's see, uh, up to 25 points for 250 words. I need to modify that too. Up to 50 points for 500 words on this topic. So again, for those uh, who are trying to make up enough points uh, to, uh, uh, to do well in the class. This is good. Um, this one is due on November 25th. And there's one more extra credit after that. Uh, same type of deal, up to 25 points for 250 words, up to 50 points for 500 words. Um, and that'll be the last one that will open up after Thanksgiving. So that one is about uh, media research and the social impacts of media. So you, you have those two that are available to you. Uh, and, you know, looking ahead in the syllabus, there's not a whole lot left to do. Um, there's a discussion uh, uh, online which opens up on the 18th. We'll close up on the 27th. I'll be talking more about it, but it's it's about the kind of programming you see on television. So uh, we'll look at the prompt next week, but it's basically just writing about a TV show that you like and finding out a little bit about how it's made. You know, if you like reality TV, you can find out a little bit about how reality TV is done, or if you like dramas or comedies or sports. Um, it's really quite open for you to discuss what you find, you know, most exciting or interesting on TV right now. And then the big thing coming up, which I just wanted to tell you all, the research paper due on the last day of class. So this is very much like the first one, which I know discouraged a bunch of people. So again, I'll be doing my very best to help you do it. Where is it? Uh, let's just see. Um, I can't help you if you don't try. So uh, count on trying. There are five different uh, topics that you can pick from. Uh, which cover radio, satellite radio, uh, and uh, uh, television networks and such, and also uh, social networking as news reporting, things like that. So um, again, next class we're going to start looking at each of these topics 
uh, in you know sort of one topic per class to help you figure out which one you want to do. And uh, again, you, you have to try to do it in order for me to help you. So um, we want to, to do that. So as of next class, next week, I know Thanksgiving is coming up. We only have one class next week, but we'll start in on that, OK? So uh, and then, of course, we've got the final exam. Uh, but as you can see, we're almost through. So take heart, because we're all tired now, I'm sure. So. This is uh, the industry news presentation, one of my favorite things to do because I can hear all of the great information that uh, you guys bring in regarding the latest developments in the industries. And uh, we can sometimes connect it to stuff that we've been learning about in lecture, which is usually very uh, uh, kind of uh, textbooky and tied to concepts uh, stuff. So I enjoy this. So um, what we're going to do, as uh, mentioned before, uh, is uh, we'll bring the teams up. And each team was randomly sorted into uh, um, areas of the media industry to cover. And everyone was to bring in one news item summarized. Hopefully it will last a minute or so, not significantly longer. And so each member of the group should take the mic on their turn, stand. There's an X here because Jody has the camera set up. And you are going to be anchor person on camera uh, telling us the news item. So uh, do, do your best anchor, anchor person imitation. And uh, of course, it's fine if you read the news item off your phone, off a piece of paper, however you've prepared. Uh, that's that's absolutely fine. Hold the mic close. Speak up because apparently we don't get all that much uh, uh, audio level through the mic. So there we go. Any questions about how this should go? Can you introduce us somewhere? Uh, yeah, that's a good idea, Chow. Please say your name before you start, just because since a lot of people uh, do the class by streaming, we don't even know who everybody is, basically. So do say, hi, I'm Malcolm, and uh, this is my report on you know, Sony or whatever. OK, that's a great question. Thank you, Chow. <clears throat> OK, well, um, whoops, gosh. Uh, here in industry team one, which is covering radio, uh, we have Gordon and Katya and uh, Vicent. So, hi Miko, uh, we're just getting started. So can we have industry news team one, number one up and you guys could decide whoever will go first. I guess we will make it. So Gordon and Katya are here. You guys are the icebreakers. Thank you for going. Bird will go first. All right, here we are. X marks the spot. Thank you, Gordon, for breaking the ice. Hello, I'm Gordon, and uh, I report is on Intercom's radio station. So on uh, November 12, 2018, Brands Detroit Business says one of the radio stations previously known as 98.7 Amp Radio uh, was changed to 98.7 The Breeze. They changed the station's music choices from pop to Christmas songs. They changed the station because they were entering Christmas mode. And a Nielsen ratings report for October showed their previous station, Amp Radio, were not keeping up with another local radio station, Channel 955 WKQI, Intercoms. Detroit Senior Vice President and Market Manager Debbie Kenyon says, We know this station will become a must listen to make their workday breeze by. They are confident this move will help improve the rating. Thank you, Gordon. Hello, I'm Katrina, and my report is on iHeartMedia. On November 1st, the Verge reported that iHeartMedia is exploring investments with several companies, including Apple, in advance of filing for bankruptcy protection in March. iHeartMedia is looking for an equity stake worth tens of millions of dollars. The source suggested that deal could look like a marketing partnership, rather than a direct cash infusion into the company. 
If a deal were to come to fruition between Apple and iHeartRadio, this could deliver additional distribution to Apple Music Beats 1 Radio, bringing it to broadcast radio. Currently, Beats 1 is only available through the Apple Music and iTunes. Also, increased distribution for Beats 1 and Apple Music to traditional radio may help convert, convert older listeners that haven't embraced the concept of audio streaming into customers. iHeartMedia, the largest radio company in the US, has $20 billion in debt, but still dominates over the radio industry with 850 stations. It also commands considerable power with exposure for acts of big names events like iHeart Heart Radio Music Awards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, great job. Uh, it's wonderful that you also say the source of uh, where the information is coming from. Let's just quickly, just quickly relate what was said in terms of news to some of the things we've said either about ownership or in the past. Gordon's talking about a very important and rare moment in uh, the lifespan of a radio station where they flip formats. So as you know, radio stations typically program in a very tightly controlled format to bring a certain segment of the audience to advertisers. Once in a while, they decide they could do better if they change their format and go after a different segment. So that's what Gordon has talked about. Intercom is, I think, the third largest radio station owner group in the country. So they must have a couple hundred stations. And once in a while, they will flip a station like that. Uh, so what uh, Gordon was talking about how they were transitioning into a, a holiday the breeze uh, yeah a holiday uh, format H uh, how long is that going to, to hold up how, uh, would they then uh, change formats again once the season is over mm -hmm. I think a seasonal change like that wouldn't be the defining thing about the radio station like I can't believe that as soon as they finish with New Year's, they'll start on Valentine's Day programming or something. Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, I wouldn't put it past them. To yeah. have this transition and then in another couple of months have another transition into yeah. another established format. Like, yeah. that, that, that turnaround seems like a lot of work and a lot of like jobs changing hands. Yes. Definitely. Well, we might look and see what eventually is, you know, the officially declared format. For the moment, for instance, Nielsen doesn't chart stations under holiday or something like that. They have, you know, about 30 different formats that, that stations are clustered into. Uh, however, programming holiday music is uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it, K, K, no, what is it? KOIT mm -hmm. uh, uh, is the number one FM station in the Bay Area, partly because they start Christmas programming right now. So it's a proven successful strategy. Right. The rest of the year, they are kind of an easy listening station of ballads and old rock songs and stuff. And so uh, this, uh, this transition into the format for the, uh, uh, for the station that's covered in the story, they would probably keep to that kind of format. It's possible. It's possible. You have to see what the official transition mm -hmm. is, but doing it now, doing it in the holiday period is probably a good commercial strategy because everybody wants that background music. Right. And I think another thing that's very informative about what Gordon brought to us was just that, you know, what did they say is the top line marketing idea in that uh, uh, news item was this will help people pass the time at work. You know, and unfortunately, you know, we may want communication and electronic media to give us what we're passionate about, but it seems like some of the number one stations give us background music just to get by, you know, and, they, and that's how they're successful formula. So that was interesting. Uh, Katrina, very interesting. I mean, just who would have thought that the largest uh, uh, station owner group in the United States with 850 stations, as you said, is constantly teetering on bankruptcy. But it is. They have, as you said, $20 billion of debt. Uh, they have a hard time making enough money to pay off the interest payments on those loans of $20 billion of debt. You could imagine yearly, that's a lot of money you've got to pay to a bank in addition to running a business and paying your employees and such like that. So uh, once upon a time, Clear Channel bought over a 1,000 stations, paid for it with bank money, 
and uh, they eventually are trying desperately to survive. They've become iHeartRadio, uh, but they are still, uh, you know, have to pay that money down. And uh, so you can see there's always in the news some kind of new strategy. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you both. And unfortunately, we won't be able to do all of this because we'll never finish with everybody. We can't feed back on everybody's uh, stuff, but we'll, we'll try anyway. So um, team two, and, and here I also for those folks who walked in, we're, we have this. Team two. Uh, team two is Isabella, Alexander, Paul, and Max. Is anybody here from team two? I was on team. Pardon me? Ah, okay. Team two is streaming audio. Is that Hello? streaming audio? Um, on a phone company. You're in a phone company, so that would be, I think, team eight, Chow. Oh. Yeah. Sorry about the numbers and stuff. So is nobody present from team two, it seems like? Oh, you are? Oh, Paul. Yes? So come on. Come on up when you are ready. Unfortunately, you're only all by yourself. All right. Well, that's it. Do you want the sign-in sheet, Josiah? Yeah. Yeah, on the spot, the X. The there you spot. go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, it was announced on September 20th that Spotify plans on adding a new feature for independent artists. This, new, this news comes after Spotify struck to deal with independent artists. The service will allow artists to upload their music without the need of a record label, uh, allowing the artists to control every aspect of their music and allowing them to receive most of the revenue. Even though the service is still in beta level, it has about 200,000 active users. This program, need, this program comes out of Spotify's CEO stating he wants to create a two-sided marketplace. Okay, do you, do you know what he meant by a two-sided marketplace? Um, the consumer and the artist. Okay, yeah. okay, interesting. So, Thank you. A weird up here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's life as an anchor person. You have to get used to it. We had two a uh, uh, journalist from Cron in on, uh, well, last Tuesday, yeah. How was it? It was good? Mm -hmm. People who attended? Yeah, I thought it was, it was pretty inspiring. Yeah. Very charismatic people. I mean, it was like turning on a light. So way to go, Paul. Thank you. Uh, so uh, any comment on the importance of Spotify opening up that new opportunity for independence? Nothing? Uh, you know, Spotify, sometimes any, any of the music streaming services, because there's been such a huge transition in the music business where, you know, piracy, first of all, it brought the bottom out of the business. And now, uh, you know, it seems like the way everyone wants their music distributed is through a streaming service. A lot of them are, are you know, uh, criticized for uh, paying very, very little, you know, and especially to uh, artists who do not have you know, huge volume downloads, but instead, you know, maybe respected artists, but have a smaller audience. And, you know, they're looking at, uh, you know, uh, monetizing their work over 10 years or something, and they're only getting, you know, a few thousand dollars a year. Uh, you, you can't really make a living that way. And so this has been a, a, a criticism of the streaming audio business as a whole is just the kind of fractional amount of money that bands make. So it just sounds like they are addressing that, you know, while keeping the service as a cash cow for the Katy Perry's and the people who get, you know, 50 million downloads uh, or, or spins, like not just downloads, but, you know, also maybe making it a little more sustainable for new acts, which I, th I think is a good PR move and good for, you know, the creative life of music. And I think it speaks on the trajectory of uh, art now, where we're, uh, artists are desperately trying to cut out the middleman that is taking a lot of percentage of their uh, of their income yeah. off of things that they aren't creating. Yeah. So uh, it makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I see a theme here as well as like you know we're not nostalgic for the old business because the middlemen were insane. You know mm -hmm. the record industry of the past was nuts. 
but uh, but then you know, who's the new boss? It's the streaming service. So yeah, good points. Yeah. Righto. So uh, group three is presenting about network television. Um, so this would include Gloria, who's here, you, uh, Lack, Michaela, and Ramon. And I'm not sure you may be solo today, Gloria. Okay, come on up. All right. Oh, Lack, here you are. Okay. Hey guys, I'm Gloria. So according to an article posted on October 14, 2018, published by Deadline.com, the CW Network has launched a campaign called Open to All. The CW is basically announcing its efforts in inclusion and representation, both behind the scenes and on screen. Mark Pedowitz, the network president, said, We think this campaign really captures the spirit and mission of the CW and why our fans come to us. We are committed to making sure our viewers see themselves represented on screen and that we also have diverse voices behind or being heard behind the camera. So currently the CW, 47% um, of series regulars are women, 49% of them are people of color. Near, nearly two-thirds of the showrunners, writers, directors are um, uh, women or people of color, and this is a significant increase from the 53% last year. Um, you will find this campaign on the web, on air, social media, print, and a video spot featuring stars from the CW shows. So look out for hashtag CW open to all and the message, we are open to all, all identities, all orientations, all choices, and all possibilities. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lam, and I got from NBC News. So on October 8th, 2018, NBC reported that Facebook launched to in-home video chat device known as the Facebook Photo and Photo Plus. This device is centered around video chat and feature camera, speaker, screen, and microphone. The photos cost $199 and Photo Plus cost $349. Many people don't use this device because they don't trust it and understand the way that microphone enable device work. The Facebook say the Photos AI technology runs on the device, not on the Facebook server and a small camera does, doesn't identify you. Consumer can also delete a history of their photo calls on Facebook and set up a passcode to keep their screen locked. Now it's up to the customer to decide if they want to do this thing by the side or not. Okay. Pardon me? Uh, no, I, I think I got the wrong title. Oh, okay, okay. H however, it seems like the news is about Facebook, right? Yeah. But it came from NBC. Okay, well, we're just looking forward to the social media development. But uh, thank you. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, how many people are likely to feel good about the CW uh, being a place which is inclusive, diverse, which cares about who's on camera and behind camera? Does, does that matter? Does it, if, it, if you think it, it does, I see Mesa, you're, you're nodding. Other folks? Okay, <laughs> lifting a hand is too much today. Uh, however, I, I walked right into that one. Uh, but yeah, it's obviously uh, uh, something we hear a lot about, diversity in the entertainment business. And uh, you know, we've heard it about Hollywood. Uh, and I think CW is very, very smartly playing uh, that uh, aspect of, of their, you know, one of their strengths. Uh, and per, do you think it's perhaps also linked to the younger demographic that they pursue with their programming? You know, uh, I think uh, that you're less likely to see CBS, which has these ancient dinosaur showrunners that uh, have 30 year track history of success in, you know, the police detective show or something. Those are typically old white guys who make those types of shows and star in those types of shows. But I think the CW has a huge opportunity uh, to, to diversify you know, everybody behind and in front of the camera. So, so brilliant coup. Uh, Lack, I, I, you know, maybe we'll come back, social uh, time, social uh, uh, media, but it sounds like Facebook has a hardware piece that they're offering. Is that, is that it? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting development. All right. Thank you. So next up, cable TV group. Uh, and so that would be 
Brendan, Tristan, Lupe, Vladimir. Anybody here today <laughs> from the group? Well, um, I am, but I did not do... Well, Lupe, which one did you do? I actually kind of was confused. Um, well, you can come, well, whatever you did, you can come up now if you want. Is it okay if I actually go after to see, like, how it's going to be portrayed? Because I'm kind of a little bit nervous to be... Okido, okay. Is it okay? Like, I'll just go... Yeah. But do remind me at the end that, that, hey, I still have to go. Okay, okay. Yeah, I will. I do, you, do you have a, do you have a, I didn't bring a paper. An item? I do, yeah, I do. What is the item connected um, it's, to? It's connected to also like diversity, but it's from a Vice, Vice News. But what part of the business is it about? That's all. Is it, is it about television? Is yeah, it it's about... more of like YouTube, like how like YouTube okay. is being portrayed and like so, taking the news to YouTube. All right. The only thing is that the, the video streaming is the next one up. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's okay. Why don't you, why don't you uh, just come in last, I guess. Okay. All righty. Uh, I mean, I did email everybody constantly, give them, put them into groups and all the rest. But, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get you in last so you have a chance to see what this whole thing is all about. So nobody else from cable streaming then. So Brendan, Tristan, Lupe's here, obviously. Vladimir? Nope. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to video streaming. So that would be, um, oh my god, sorry. I just clicked my tab here. Um, Tony. I don't see Tony. Williams here. Lonnie and uh, Michael and Mesa. Yes? <laughs> We got a whole bunch of people. Anybody have a preference? Who wants to go first? All right, Mesa. There you are. X marks the spot. My name is Mesa Michael Williams. The, Euro the European Union approved the copyright legislation on September 12th called the Copyright Directive. The only, uh, there's a way when a government wants to add stronger legislation and it's Article 13 of the new proposal has gained the most ire. Uh, Article 13, if enacted in its current form, aims to stop copyrighted work from being uploaded to the internet. And if this law is broken, platforms such as YouTube, Vimeo, and Facebook would be accountable. This would, be, this would put tremendous risk towards platforms and would most likely result in platforms restricting the user's ability to broadcast themselves. Uh, the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, uh, uh, said on October 22nd in a blog for YouTube creators, the proposal will, for, uh, quote, the proposal will force platforms like YouTube to, to prioritize content from, small, from a small number of large companies. The burden of copyright proof will be too high for most independent creators to instantly uh, demonstrate. While the directive has already been passed, uh, the language of the article is yet to be finalized, so there may be a hope for European creators. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Hello. William. Uh, and as of November 8th, uh, Netflix is officially looking into the Asia uh, market in a story um, on NBC.com. Uh, uh, Karen Gilcrest reported that a streaming service it announced that over the next several years, the company plans to expand its regional service into Asia. Uh, Chief Content Officer uh, Ted uh, Sarandos uh, did state that uh, Netflix in China is still a little far away. Instead, uh, they, they plan to land, launch some 100 original programs in their new India market and plan to expand subscriber bases by 100 million in the, next, in the region over the next couple of years. This goal seems rather realistic as there's upwards of 450 million internet users in India alone, and uh, they've already uh, accumulated some uh, 50 million subscribers in the region already, so they're about halfway there. Uh, this number also uh, is extremely close to the 58 million that are in uh, America, that, uh, that's their total subscriber base in, in America. So they're, they're definitely reaching a wider audience at this point. Oh, thank you. So my article is on YouTube launches breaking news. 
top news features in Singapore, and this was issued on the 13th of November. YouTube announced the rollout of breaking news and top news features for viewers in Singapore. It is also it is part of YouTube's ongoing investment in product innovation to improve the news experience on the platform to make credible sources more ready, ready accessible to users, the social media giant said. When a breaking news event happens, the breaking news shelf will highlight videos from news organizations about the, that event on the YouTubers or YouTube homepage. This way viewers are proactively alerted to breaking news, YouTube said. To make it easier to find quality news, a top news shelf prominently highlights videos from credible news sources in search results. If a, if a viewer searches for a particular news topic on YouTube, they will see a top news shelf near the top results featuring relevant videos from trusted sources. When the viewer watches videos from the top news and breaking news shelves, they will also get a suggestion from more credible sources in up next sec sections. YouTube said the credibil credibility of sources are determined by raters around the world who are help who help inform Google search rankings. The features have already been launched in the U.S. and have, are also available in Asian countries such as Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Malaysia, and India. Hi, my name is Michael. The article I'm doing is uh, Netflix is testing cheaper mobile online subscription, which on, uh, they said that Netflix is a expanding a mobile-only subscription plan that would cut membership costs by f approximately 50%. Uh, Cameron uh, Johnson, the Netflix director of uh, product, like, said that they, uh, in July, like that 60% of members around the world now open Netflix mobile app at least once a month to watch a TV show or a movie. That most of seventy percent of American use their smart smartphones device to watch the movies, the movies and the shows. And, uh, Netflix also wants to expand the international market since since uh, we're the biggest like, con areas like growth is like nearly uh, seventy nine point million. Like, Netflix total, like total of 13 million subscriptions on the international, according to the recent post. <coughs> They're offering cheaper plans, targeting a primary mobile users in the way to increase their growth. Please. All right. Wow. That was that was just uh, gigantic news. Let's take Netflix first, okay. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm impressed just by the sheer numbers of Netflix. And also, I think that um, I, you know, I grew up with networks. So I grew up with networks you know, in Canada. So we had Canadian networks. We got American networks. But we never experienced anything like a global distribution company like Netflix. I mean, these are, these are things that just never existed before, right? That a company out of the United States could have a growth strategy which would involve hundreds of millions of new subscribers across the world. I mean, I think that's, that is the, you know, the important thing about Netflix. And I think we mentioned in class about, uh, you know, a few weeks ago anyway, seeing Comcast, for instance, uh, making moves to try to achieve that kind of global scale with uh, a purchase of, of a satellite uh, uh, service uh, that covers part of Asia. So, uh, I mean, I think what we're seeing now is uh, uh, established American companies 
trying to become global distribution companies. And literally nothing like that has existed in the past, really. I mean, uh, and, and you know, even national governments have kind of restrictive communication laws. Uh, but, you know, Netflix is going to wade into, you know, what kind of content are they going to put up in India? And, you know, what kinds of, uh, um, you know, programming choices will they be making and will they be responsible for? Will they be sensitive to that? Any thoughts on that? Yeah? Um, I was surprised that Netflix is going to Asian market because I understand like India, they speak English over there. So that will be so much more easier for people in India to understand all the movies in, like in English. When it comes to Asian market, I'm not sure if they are doing just subtitles so they are dubbing like the whole movie. But go, uh, for Netflix going global, I think as a person who didn't grow up in English speaking environment, this is such a nice opportunity to hear the language, to learn the language. Because like, you know, if you watch the movie, even right now on Netflix, like French movie, Movie. You know, you hear the French language, but then all, like you read some subtitles, and that helps you to, I don't know, to learn or brush up your French. Mm. So the same might happen with English, and I think uh, overall, like the long-term goal is uh, to, like, you know, this part of globalization and English becoming such a like international language. So, like, it's a good point. Just, yeah, it just it, not just Netflix; it's just like the whole society. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great opportunity for people, you know, to get exposure to other languages, and then. It's also, you know, a possible uh, new inroads to the hegemony of English in the world, right? Because, wow, all of that stuff will be there. That's interesting. Another thing I was thinking of is, you know, there's a lot of Korean television shows on Netflix right now. So there are specific, you know, national production interests. And I think maybe those might grow, you know? So an interesting way that the audience in India might be totally into, you know, I don't know, uh, Chinese historical dramas or something like that. We'll have no idea, you know, but, but it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how all that develops. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, and to, you know, uh, um, as, as we were hearing about, you know, the, the breaking news shelf in the YouTube Singapore service, I was thinking of a number of things, but I think this is going to I mean, again, in these global media companies, of which Facebook and YouTube are also obvious examples, um, you know, you know they, they are going to be responsible for the political impacts of their programming, if you want to call it, although now it's user-generated content. So I, I just think it's very interesting. First, I had no idea that YouTube was involved in delivering news, you know? But when I hear a little bit deeper in the story, uh, it seems very interesting that they're basically a ranking service, which is going to give priority to verified news sources. So I detect a hint of, you know, proactive, let's make sure the first thing you don't get to is some, you know, kind of totally racist partisan video about, uh, you know, ethnic cleansing in our country. You know what I mean? It's like, because in, in Myanmar recently, uh, Facebook ran into a lot of criticism for allowing, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, very, not just partisan, but, you know, basically contributing to, you know, sending out news which was related to ethnic cleansing. So, so I, I think they're probably covering themselves in this way as well. It's, it's I don't know, these are all, like I said, huge things. Really interesting. Thank you, guys. Can't um, got to move on. Uh, but any comments about that before we move on? Pretty heavy topic, but you know, interesting. Okay, uh, Team Six was working on social media. Speak of the speak of uh, social media. Uh, we have in Team Six Desiree, who can't make it, Gabe, and Josias, and uh, Francis, who I wouldn't recognize. <laughs> <laughs> but so Gabe and Josias? Yes. I'm actually working on like my script right now. Pardon me? I'm working on my script right now. So. It's kind of late, but uh, you can go with the other people who are working on their scripts. <laughs> okay, so we'll put you down there. Uh, it should be ready in about 10 minutes because uh, we're moving pretty fast through the groups. Josias, you're going to go first? All right. Uh, my name is Josias, and I'm going to do an article from the New York. Times, and it's about uh, Facebook, how Facebook failed to police how its partners handle users' data, and uh, uh, 
Uh, Facebook failed to closely monitor uh, device makers like Apple or like Samsung uh, after granting them access to the personal data of hundreds of people, and it started. Uh, and, and it was never really revealed to the users for quite a while until recently. And uh, and the de details of these oversights were revealed in a letter that Facebook sent to Senator Ron Wyden, an or Oregon Democrat. In the letter, Facebook wrote that it went into a data sharing agreement with device makers uh, to create a Facebook experience, which gave those manufact manufacturers customer access to Facebook's to Facebook on their phone. Uh, Facebook ultimately entered into a dozen of similar data sharing partnerships, most of which the company began winding down this spring after revelations that it had allowed Cambridge and Analytica, a political data firm, to acquire the personal information of tens of millions of people. Uh, the firm used some of that information in efforts to aid President Trump's 2016 campaign. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, on October 26th, Verge reports that Snapchat will bring its camera to the desktop to add filters to your streaming videos. Snap announced the integration on stage at SwitchCon. Snap Camera, which is available today for Mac and Windows, will integrate with apps including Twitch, YouTube, Skype, and Zoom. Uh, you'll be able to use the filters while streaming a game of Fortnite or updating your co-workers about sales. The Switch integration will also include several new game theme lenses, including ones based on characters from League of Legends, World of Warcraft, and many other popular streaming games. All right. Are people likely to take advantage of those filters? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I don't, do you guys know people who are into that? Or Obviously, I wouldn't, right? <laughs> I hear about them three years later, and I think, wow, that's so cool. But no, I don't know. Yeah? I mean, it kind of depends, because filters, like, for, there's an example, like, with photographers, like, they send their clients the pictures, right? And, like, photographers get offended if the client puts a filter on their picture because mm. the photographer did all the editing and did all the hard work to later have the customer just put a filter on it. And like, oh, okay. You know? okay. But I also do think that photographers do take advantage of using filters to really also, like, enhance, give, like, the photo an aesthetic or mm. even, like, something more. It's, like, to play around with an aesthetic. Okay, okay. Got it. And, and that, you know, I mean, there's like the Instagram look. Like, I mean, you know, it, it basically can brand a whole service. It's true. And then everybody wants that look, mm -hmm. even in their wedding pictures or something like that. So, so that makes sense. But I thought when, uh, well, I thought what Francis was talking about was not just like the image quality type of filter, but also like you can, you know, project a character face on your own kind of. Was I wrong about that? Or was that, was that what you were talking about? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so, so it goes beyond just the, you know, the kind of dreamy quality of the image, but rather, you know, what can you project on your face and what character can you play from, like you were talking about, some intensely popular game or something like that. So do you, do you folks know anybody who might be interested in that type of thing? I, know, I mean, I know my, you know, 12-year-old kid would be, like, super interested in that. the younger generation, for sure. Yeah, I think so. Huh? Yeah. I mean, they're already, like, doing the dances out of these games and, like, everything. So, so that, that could definitely, you know, drive, <laughs> drive parents insane. <laughs> it could also drive, you know, adoption of a, a, a you know... Of a platform like Snap or something, which again, you know, I always know it more as a messaging type of thing, but uh, or messaging type of thing. But uh, obviously, for different demos, the these services have different um, different things they love about it, I guess. So yeah, and Snap was also putting news up too at some point. <laughs> I can't keep track of it. Okay. Uh, we're on to uh, group number seven, which is advertisers. There are only eight groups for those who are coming.
those who came in late or those who are just getting their stuff together, we're, we're getting there, we're getting close. So in advertising, um, Miko, Erica, Ibu. So Miko, all right. You're solo today. You're holding down the entire advertising industry, buddy. It's good, it's good. <laughs> Hi, guys. My name is Elf. My name is Miko. Uh, I'm doing a, an article about the Havas Group Media and Arena Media. It's a combined, it's a, it's a combined uh, single management group that was combined around 2017. The media now operates mainly in Western Europe and the Americas, and that is one of the smallest consolidated global media networks. In their most recent projects, in uh, in the collabor with the collaboration with Disney's new movie Zootopia, the media group the media group decided to mimic the daily metro subway commute of thousands in France, with a twist of Zootopia, <laughs> to bring out all the character spirits into life. They have they have emphasized the life of the film and brought out a never before seen technology in France by putting by putting out ten different screens that are equipped with infrared to detect the arrival of trains in the stations. As it triggers animation and it creates similarities for both worlds, even the station billboards get a Zootopia makeover. The campaign got a lot of media attention and thousands of commuters were sharing its characters on Twitter and Instagram. The campaign also reaches out over 6 million contacts in the metro. Zootopia clearly won the French public's heart and both young and old audiences are excited to see the film. Thank you. That was great. Max, did you have a hand up? Yeah. Yeah, quick thing. On my Canvas app, it says that I'm in Team 7. Advertising? Come on in. It does not say advertising. Oh, so which one is it? It doesn't say anything. It just says News Team 7. It says that I'm in it. Did you pick one out? I have. I picked out Fox. OK, Wait. Fox TV network, right? Yeah. OK. And you can do it with me. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, there's uh so um uh yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, Let, let's not go into why that happened, except that I first made a bunch of groups called News Team and then uh found out that I couldn't actually remove that. Uh <laughs> so most people are actually in discussion groups called, and in fact, everyone is in a discussion group called Industry News Team. Oh. If you followed the route that I gave you, which you would find your way in there, if you searched under, I don't know, groups or something, you would probably find a different one, which was confusing. And I apologize for all of it. But as long as someone has something to say, that's the important thing, right? Whether or not, you know, uh, my little strategy uh, which is a, a work in progress, actually worked. We're good. So, uh, so cool. Um, so, Miko, thank you. That was, uh, uh, you know, that had a lot of features which are pretty cool. Basically, a global advertising group plus, you know, a really big campaign for a Hollywood movie in a foreign country and a really splashy kind of strategy of taking Very over. interactive, I should say. Uh-huh, absolutely. I would be proud if I see that shit too. Absolutely, and you'd be sharing it just as we always, yeah. yeah. Does anybody here know more about like have us as an agency as to, has anyone worked in marketing or gotten into any of it? Okay, I, you know, it's, it's the thing that I know the least about in terms of electronic media is like these huge global advertising companies, but there are, a bunch of them, uh, and they, they, you know, they have kind of affiliates in individual countries and stuff, but they have the reach to be able to, you know, originate a campaign in New York and have it executed like throughout Europe and Asia and stuff with a consistent brand. And it's, uh, it's also a, a giant business. I think, I think this business is going to be booming like, in like the next coming years. Yeah, yeah. Especially like like San Francisco, Tech City. It oh, for sure. Not like crazy. Yeah, and you know the other thing is with these global companies trying to reach audiences across the world, and this type of ad agency structure where they've got you know an office in Singapore which knows that culture inside out. They know what's going to work, so they can kind of localize. 
uh, you know, global brand and, and, and sell it the way that they think people are going to be interested in, in consuming it there. So there's, you know, it's just a ton of interesting stuff. And for people working in that industry, you know, the ability to move throughout the world is, it's a possibility, you know. Okay, well, uh, so uh, our last official team, and then we'll just have, um, you know, catching up with a diversity of, of views uh, is the mobile biz. So that would be uh, Samantha, Chris, Chow, Adrian, Adrian Jean. All right. So we have Chow. Hi, I'm Chow, and I'll be doing a report on T Mobile and Ericsson signed major $3.5 billion dollar 5G agreement. T-Mobile, a huge phone company, reports on September 11, 2018 that they signed a $3.5 billion contract with Ericsson, a Swedish multinational telecommunication company. T-Mobile chief technology officer Neville Ray says, with this new Ericsson agreement, we're laying the groundwork for 5G and with Sprint, we can supercharge the 5G revolution. Neville Ray wants to keep his word, not just make promises and break them unlike other phone companies. The contract provides T-Mobile with the latest 5G network, promising to deliver very high data speeds, extreme low latency, ultra high reliability, energy efficiency, and extreme device density. Nicholas Hugo, president and head of Ericsson North America, then tells us, we have recently decided to increase our investments in the United States to be closer to our leading customers and better support them with their accelerated 5G deployments. Nicholas is excited about the $3.5 billion contract with T-Mobile and Sprint because the agreement will help support them to strengthen, expand, and speed up the deployment of their nation 5G deployment. Thank you, Chao. Samantha, um, kind of piggybacking, back, piggybacking off of what Chow said. Um, I'm also reporting on T-Mobile, but I'm reporting something a little different. So on October 8th, T-Mobile announced a merger with wireless company Metro PCS, which is officially now known as Metro by T-Mobile. Metro by T-Mobile is the first prepaid wireless provider to commit to 5G service in the next year as T-Mobile begins to transition into offering 5G services and 5G capable smartphones. This is huge news for the tens of millions of wireless users who want to keep up with next generation's technology while maintaining an affordable price point. Metro by T-Mobile's new unlimited rate plans also feature Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime and Google One along with the 5G service, which is monumental for the prepaid users who have had to sacrifice accessibility for affordability in the past. Cool. All right. Thoughts on that? I'm a thinking, I'm a thinking. I mean, it's nice that people are taking care of the prepaid market now, having been in that market forever and ever myself. Uh, I was always like jealous of the subscribers who got all the cool features. Um, and the other thing I just, you know, it's you conspicuously absent are AT&T and uh, Verizon from that. So it's like kind of, those are the those are the biggies and everyone else is, is you know, trying to, uh, trying to compete and not get gobbled up but okay cool thank you for those uh, all right so let's just get a sense of who hasn't been up yet Lupe Max and Gabe anybody else anybody else okay well why, why don't you guys just come up all three and uh, you just so, so uh, uh, before launching into your news item, just like tell us, oh, it's about the TV business or it's about whatever business. And so just sure, I'll start. people people get going so fast in this minute. I'm, I'm kind of sometimes, well, what are we talking about? So thank you, Max. Uh, X, X marks the spark, buddy. Okay. Thank you. I guess mine is about the TV business. I hope so. All right. Um, my name's Max, and I'm going to be doing a report on Fox. On Monday, October 8th, Fox announced that Hope Hicks, the former White House communications director and Trump advisor, would take over as the communications chief for the new Fox company, which has been created using the remaining assets and shares 
that Disney did not purchase when they requ when they acquired 21st Century Fox on July 27th of this year. While Hicks did not comment on her hiring in Fox's press release, she received praise from former colleague and White House press secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who tweeted, Fox won't find anyone smarter or more talented than Hope Hicks. On the other hand, according to Hollywood Reporter, many employees are exasperated with the hiring and that it proves that even though this new age of Fox has claimed to be streamlining its content to focus more on sports, entertainment, and news, the cozy relationship between the president and Fox is here to stay for a while. <laughs> Thank you, Max. I see what you mean. Yes. All right. Definitely about TV, that one, but... <laughs> Cool. All right, uh, mine was about social media, and it was about... Uh, so this is Gabe, everybody. Say hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, Twitter releases... My topic is Twitter releases data on usage trends since the change up to... Uh, Get the mic close to you. 280 characters. So when Twitter first announced that it was considering switching from 140 characters per tweet to 280 characters, instead of users immediately expressed a um, mix of outrage and confusion. People love that uh, Twitter was all about short, straight-to-the-point messaging. The character limit was a fundamental part of this. The fact that Twitter changed this was viewed as sacrilegious and an affront to their day-to-day -day experience. Expanding tweet limit has led to a wholesale change in the platform. The new tweet capacity has led to have been largely positive for the most part, providing new ways for users to connect and interact in a more civilized and engaging way. Thank you. Right. Hello, everybody. My name is Lupe. Um, so I have done Vice News, but Vice News is actually part of HBO. So it was correlated to actual uh, okay. uh, TV cable. But instead, I did want to give you something more direct about HBO instead of Vice News, which was a YouTube channel that then HBO hired to be a part of Vice, to be a part of it. So my article was by the end. Of, by The Independent, um, and it was on October 29th um, that HBO hired an intimacy coordinator to oversee actors' well-being while filming sex scenes. Um, and HBO is kind of known, like, well, the article, quote-unquote, said that they're raunchy, like, network, but, like, they've always shown a lot of, like, nudity, and, like, um, one of their examples is, like, they have Game of Thrones and The Deuce. So um, they announced that they wanted to make scenes sex scenes more comfortable and safer for actors. And Rolling Stone reported that they hired Alicia Vardis to oversee this. And she uh, is actually, uh, she to oversee the deuce. And she, since ever since they hired her, now HBO makes it mandatory to have a, like an intimacy coordinator in a lot of scenes now. Um, and Radis oversees multiple productions such as Crashing and Watching Men. Um, and this has been an issue that has been ignored as in like making actors feel safer. And this changes the power dynamics on sets as well. Um, and what she basically does is that she reviews scripts and she facilitates groups discussions prior to the scene. Um, and then she also meets individually with the actors that are going to be a part of the scene. So this really makes sure, like this, she makes sure that everybody's well informed before the scene happens and that even before moving forward, that everyone is like on the roll of what's gonna go, like what's going to happen. And she did say that one of the many reasons why she does this is to voice actors and also to make sure that producers are doing the best to make sure that their sets are safe. So. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So, those were interesting. Uh, what do you guys think about the intimacy coordinator position? Yes? It's interesting because we learned that all the networks, they have kind of, not censorship, but they have certain limits that where they can go. And HBO is known for being so open about uh, their scenes. Uh, very interesting perspective from the point of view of the actor. Because like, I was never thinking, of, like I was never thinking about, you know, actors are getting paid, so they are supposed to sign up for doing scenes like open, like, I don't know, sexual thing, same so or anything like that. It's, again, very interesting perspective from like 
actors union i don't know and also it's nice that that person is female because i think it voices um it stands out for a lot of women who are involved into filming yeah yeah great points great points so remember the fcc which has content uh guidelines for broadcasters that doesn't apply to cable right the whole idea is that the fcc uh, is, is empowered by the government because over the air, over the radio or television waves, is a public good, but the cable is not. So the whole idea is that if you subscribe to HBO, you've made your choice, it's up to you what kind of content is there. So HBO doesn't have the same restrictions that ABC or the CW has. Therefore, they can show more nudity, more violence and stuff. And so it makes a lot of sense that HBO is launching this position. And then, you know, given our context where so many women are coming forward, high profile women in the entertainment business, you know, telling us horrific stories about their mistreatment at the hands of producers and such, it makes a lot of sense that, a, you know, a network which, uh, 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 you know, brands itself with you know, a little more sexuality on screen is now going to play it a lot safer and have, you know, a producer or, a, a, you know, a high level administrator involved in that. And, and again, it does make a lot of sense, as you're saying, from the talent perspective as well. But Lupe wants to add more. Yeah. yeah. So that also caught my attention that I wasn't really, I guess I wasn't really paying it. I knew about the women that were coming out and like expressed, like saying their experiences. But that wasn't really in my mind while I was watching like HBO all the time. Um, but what I also really wanted to point out is that she wasn't just saying that she's doing this for the production. She was like, I'm doing this to like make production safer, but also for actors. She's really wanting to voice actors and like if actors have any concerns or don't feel comfortable doing what they're supposed to be doing, because they're basically getting paid, like that's their job, but it's like, if they have concerns, they can voice it to her and she would advocate for them. Yeah, yeah, which is which is a real plus, right? I mean, one thing that's come out with all of these stories from the entertainment industry is the incredible imbalance of power that actors, uh, particularly young women actors, have versus producers, you know, and Harvey Weinstein is the, you know, poster, whatever, poster pig uh, on, on this issue, you know. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I would just say, if you didn't read Selma Hayek, uh, who's you know a, a movie star who made a film about Frida Kahlo, uh, you should you should you know just look in the New York Times a, a piece that she wrote about what she had to go through in not just sexual harassment and abuse, but also just creative abuse, like just being told that you know she was a talentless piece of whatever, constantly having to go through that. And basically, Weinstein and Miramax being the only people who would make her film, but what she had to put up with in addition to the sexual harassment, unbelievable. So, uh, you know, this is to have someone advocate on behalf of actresses, you know, uh, within the network itself can probably uh, do a better job at controlling the worst instincts of powerful producers, who, some of whom work for HBO as well, you know. I mean, we've seen many network executives step down, including the head of Amazon Studios, step down over the same sorts of allegations. So, um, you know, it's a big deal. Anybody else not, everyone had a chance to go today. And, well, thank you all. I totally enjoyed that. A round of applause for everybody. Uh, I wish we could do this more often, but doing it once already is a great thing. And, uh, you know, some people came together a little later than others, but it all came together. So what you need to do now in order to get your credit for this is to post your script into the actual assignment. So you did go to the discussion in order to get things organized, and that was already bad enough. Uh, but hopefully there is only one prompt for the industry news assignment. So as I said, there are many ways you could submit this. Uh, if it's on paper, you can take a picture of the paper. If it's written up as a script, you can either uh, open up a text box and copy paste the script in, or you can uh, uh, upload a Word doc or a PDF. But one thing you can't do is just 
copy the original news item and give it to me as yours because that truly is plagiarism. So in this case, you do have to paraphrase uh, or, you know, uh, you know, whatever. This has to be your writing. Um, so that, that's the point, all right? So this has, you have a week to do this before it becomes late, okay? So this is uh, deadline, well, this says November 15th because I was worried that people wouldn't think that, well, is it on the 15th or the 22nd I have to come in? So this is gonna turn into the 22nd, so get this in. I know four people already have, thank you. And uh, for those who had to be absent due to, you know, air quality or whatever, um, they can get at least partial credit by turning in uh, this assignment here. So that's a word to anybody who might be streaming. All right. So thank you so much. If I don't see you on Tuesday next week, have a great Thanksgiving holiday. And, you know, we're going to start talking about that final research essay and giving you some ideas about that. So have a good holiday. Thank you again. Thank it was you. fun. It was really fun.